All right, let's go ahead and get started. This is the ACE working group meeting at IETF 119. So that means if you're interested in authentication and authorization for constrained environments, you are in the right place. This is the IETF note well, which hopefully you've seen by now. Uh, by being here and participating, you agree to abide by these procedures. So please make sure you're aware, with all, aware of all of them. And as a special note, it's very important to pay attention to the IETF code of conduct. Uh, all participants need to treat each other with respect. It's of course, okay to disagree with each other about the ideas, uh, but please be very careful to treat each other well. It uh, has a very uh, big impact on how well the group functions. So uh, it's something that I pay close attention to. And lastly, uh, we have a full agenda. Uh, we have the quick uh, introduction from the chairs. Uh, then uh, I don't think we will have any changes to the agenda, uh, but if anybody uh, would like to make some comments on the agenda, Marco. Yeah, from my right. point of view, it's just fine to swap the last two items. I mean, PubSub profile is quite short and really if time allows. Okay, yeah, that works for me. All right, so we will swap seven and eight and we will do EDH OC OS core profile before ACE pub sub. And that's it for the agenda. So up first is OS core GM admin. Uh, I have, should have the slides right here so I can go ahead and put them up. All right, uh, Marco, are you presenting Thank this you. one? Yes. Okay, uh, this is an update on the Oscar Jim admin draft. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and as a quick recap, this document has been along uh, for a while on defining uh, a second uh, administrative interface uh, on the group manager uh, for group Oscar. Uh, so allowing in an administrator client to basically create, delete, configure, reconfigure um, OSCOR groups that then can separately be uh, joined by actual group members. So of course we are using ACE to enforce access control in the interest of, again, administrators in this case, and uh, uh, the group manager is the resource server, like for the other interface document, and as to, to, to the secure communication between the administrator and the group manager, it's really up to uh, whatever transfer uh, profile of AC you want to use. Uh, uh, next slide, please. please Marco, ho hold on, Marco, before you proceed. Yeah, one second, we uh, forgot to assign a note taker, so uh, we're <laughs> getting some volunteers. Yeah. Can someone please volunteer in the room? Thank you, Paul. And I'll help out one, when on presenting. <laughs> yes, course. thank you, Marco. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry about sure. that. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and this has been very stable for a while. Uh, the group manager has uh, a single group collection resource that can be uh, accessed in order to retrieve a list uh, of existing uh, groups or group configurations or to create a new one. Uh, and then it has a number of child resources, uh, one per group. And, and each including the current configuration uh, for that group. And the configuration can be uh, retrieved uh, entirely, partly by filtering, or it can be uh, entirely overwritten or partially updated or deleted, uh, uh, thereby deleting the group. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, after the uh, Prague meeting last year, uh, version 10, I went in working group last call for a couple of weeks, uh, got completed. Uh, we got very good, very good comments uh, on the list uh, from Sigdem and Joran, uh, plus uh, many additional comments from uh, Karsten of list, uh, who also made a pull request. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, very good comments and very helpful. Uh, before this cutoff, uh, we submitted an update, version 11, uh, that we believe is fully addressing the reviews from uh, Sigdem and Joran, and the editorial comments, plus uh, some more uh, from Karsten, but more is left uh, to be addressed, uh, mostly due to uh, uh, lack of time. 
And we also took the opportunity to do um, some further little updates that I'll uh, recap later that we already had um, in the queue for the document. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so Jorans had basically uh, one comment uh, following Signal review. It was practically a editorial and pretty simple to address. Uh, SIGDEM uh, had a few comments instead uh, ranging from uh, well, the renaming of a parameter that made a lot of sense, uh, clarifications and, and editorial improvements uh, on uh, known limitations uh, that we are introducing on, on the issue uh, of access tokens. And she requested an example that we um, added concretely showing how um, a scope uh, can be can be modeled in terms of um, array of, of scope entries of different kind. So the example uh, shows how you can include the same scope uh, uh, scope entries with different level of complexity of group name pattern. And then she also requested that we added um, an additional example of one particular operation, a, a fetch request uh, to the group collection resource where um, that's what she wanted to see. Uh, the group name parameter used to filter uh, the expected results of the request um, specifically uses um, a complex pattern. So that was never forbidden altogether, but of course we, we overlooked the details and that are now supposed to be uh, provided. And all in this particular uh, request payload, um, is it possible to have uh, that parameter uh, not only as a simple text string, uh, but also as any cyber data item tagged to indicate uh, some complex semantics, uh, which is also now consistently updated. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, right, uh, I mentioned a few other things that we had in the queue that we also did. Uh, it was also for uh, alignment with the key group com uh, document uh, that got uh, approved for publication a few months ago uh, on using some particular parameters in some particular messages. Uh, a number of uh, clarifications. We noted that uh, one may uh, unintentionally uh, make a group inactive uh, when entirely overwriting its configuration. So you most likely don't want to do that, but still uh, that's the effect you may get uh, if you are distracted and, and you rely too much on some uh, default value for some of the parameters. So long story short, uh, unless you want to inactivate your group, uh, uh, but you want still to overwrite it altogether, uh, be sure to include the parameter active with value true in that request. Uh, we also uh, stressed very explicitly that there's only one way to create a new group and the group configuration. So just in case you send a, a put or patch i patch request uh, to a group configuration resource that doesn't exist yet, well, uh, an error response is returned. No group is created as uh, in this way as an alternative way. Uh, yeah, more followed up uh, on, on what happened in keygroup.com in terms of uh, integer numbers to be to be registered for some parameters. And like we did in that document, uh, and it's good practice to start adopting in general, not, not just a matter of alignment here, um, we made a change to not use anymore the custom uh, format for error responses that we were using, but instead uh, uh, problem details, uh, 9290. And again, here it was a matter of strict alignment with Figure.com, but in general, it's a switch that we have started to do uh, also somewhere else. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then, as I said, we, we started uh, to address custom comments. Uh, well, we merged uh, a needs pull request and made uh, some more um, editorial fixes, I think covering all the strictly editorial uh, comments. Uh, we also introduced the possible use of a better seaboard tag for indicating uh, regular expressions for the complex pattern. And uh, we stopped using uh, quotation marks to indicate the CBOR simple values uh, falls to a null to uh, avoid confusion with uh, possible text strings. Uh, next slide, please. Right, this is a, a selected uh, a list of uh, points from Karsten that we still have uh, to address uh, in the next version. Um, the first point uh, is relatively easy, but still uh, quite important. And it's uh, about examples that should stop using placeholders that can be uh, confusing, but still were used uh, as a de facto way to indicate uh, to be registered abbreviations uh, as text strings while they're intended to be integers instead. So now we have uh, a new document from 
Karsten uh, in the in the civil working group that can be taken as a starting point to make the examples uh, not ambiguous. And and this document is a good uh, starting point to try out uh, that approach. Uh, she also noted a number um, of other things about um, clarifying uh, how race conditions are supposed to be avoided if multiple administrators are responsible uh, for the same group and, and group configuration uh, and on the expected atomicity of different possibly concurrent operation uh, on the different um, group configuration on their creation possible uh, deletion and so on. Uh, he noticed, uh, I think he's right, that one particular request um, that we define for uh, overwriting at once a group configuration is not really following the semantics of the uh, of the method that it has now put. Uh, it's actually a post, that, that's what it should be. Uh, so we plan to make that change. On the topic of using the better cyber tag number uh, to indicate uh, complex semantics for group pattern. Yeah, he suggested on, on a comment uh, in a related comment on the GitHub to just abandon altogether uh, the old tag number that we were using, unless we want to introduce e even more complicated definitions that are not really worth introducing. So we plan to remove the possible use of tag 35 and stick to uh, 21065 instead. Uh, yeah, I suggest to uh, eliminate any possible source of confusion with the um, intermixed use of parameters and properties for the element of configuration. I, I think we, we have really meant parameters uh, all along. Um, in a sense, editorially, you'd like to, uh, to take an uh, early definition uh, approach, uh, especially with the concept of having permission in order to avoid repeating things uh, over and over for almost all the handlers. Uh, and even introduce some definitions that at least I was taking for granted, but it doesn't hurt to, to say up front, especially uh, scope and uh, secure communication uh, association. Uh, next slide, please. So I think that the plan is very clear at this point. What's left is addressing uh, Carsten's point uh, for the next version that we plan to have submitted, I, I really hope, uh, way before the cutoff for 120. And if nothing is left, uh, I believe that version should be eligible um, for the Shepherd write up and, and the further next steps to the ISG. Thank you. Yeah, any questions? I, I, I agree, Marco. We'll, uh, we'll get the last call finished up in the comments and we'll get it sent up to ISG as soon as it's ready. And that'll probably be, it might even uh, be an RFC by the, well, that'd eh, be a little bit fast, but uh, maybe we'll even have a chance of <laughs> making it out before the next meeting. Yeah. We'll All see. Right. Comments and questions? Nobody in the line. So in that case, we'll move on to the next document which it looks like is workflow and params. Yes, that's me again. Okay. Here you okay. go. Uh, yes, you introduced the document already. So <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, okay, to recap, this document uh, aims at updating formally uh, RFC 9200, so the main ACE framework document, uh, mostly covering uh, two points, uh, a new execution workflow or alternative execution workflow, uh, where the AS, uh, when executing that workflow, uploads the access token to the resource server um, on behalf uh, of the client. And the second point is introducing a number of parameters, uh, in some case, uh, facilitating or enabling that new workflow or otherwise uh, workflow um, independent, uh, enabling additional uh, features or optimizations uh, of the framework. Um, it was recently adopted, uh, actually after the, the Prague meeting, and this is version one further updating uh, that starting point. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, a recap uh, on the update. There were, first of all, a number of simple um, editorial uh, improvements and fixes, uh, also on clarifying the, the intention and the meaning of some parameters, and at least a stab of initial security considerations taken from other obvious documents. This one builds on uh, to be, of course, further improved um, in the future. Uh, then we have the concept of token series. It's unchanged, but it, it was appearing just uh, half hidden in one of the appendices and is now uh, moved up to the top of the document uh, in the terminology. It's relevant in this document already. And it's actually already used by uh, 
another document in a is presented uh, later today so it's good that this concept is very visible uh, where defined here and as we are saying and as it in fact happens uh, in the uh, head of the no score profile other profiles can start from that basic definition and further extend and specialize it uh, next slide please uh, right uh, we renamed one of the uh, already uh, introduced new parameters, uh, token uploaded to uh, token upload. Uh, it becomes clear why uh, in the next point. Uh, no other changes otherwise in the uh, other new already defined uh, parameters, uh, their name and semantics and used uh, even in the examples um, is unchanged. Um, considering updates to the uh, alternative workflow, uh, uh, until version zero uh, that got adopted, um, we used to build on a lot of assumption, uh, especially that uh, the client just supported the new workflow and that the authorization server uh, knew that the client supported uh, that workflow and so on. And we prefer instead to switch to an approach where uh, the client explicitly uh, opts in uh, when, requested, uh, when requesting an access token to uh, indicate that uh, it does support the uh, alternative workflow it's fine for DAS to take the direction with the final decision anyway uh, on the um, authorization server. Uh, so that also justified the change of the parameter name to token upload. And the parameter can now also be used, uh, first of all, in the access token request. So if it's included there with value true, uh, the client is telling DAS, uh, I understand this new workflow. Um, I, I would be great if you can go for it. Uh, ultimately, it's up to you. And if the AS receives such a request with the parameter present and supports the uh, new workflow itself, uh, the AS may decide to, uh, in fact, go for that workflow. And after that, things follow like uh, they were defined uh, already. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, then uh, we consider a number of other things uh, to update uh, in the framework. Uh, one is summarized in, in this slide. Uh, we prefer to act on the text right away to make it uh, clearer. Uh, we notice that uh, an appendix of the ACE RFC uh, defining the requirements on profiles of ACE uh, had two requirements that looked like, I believe, unintentionally uh, incomplete, uh, but to be fair, uh, those formulation predates uh, something that instead was defined uh, later in RFC 9175, yet later in spite of, of the numbering uh, of the RFC, um, uh, where it was noted that uh, basically when using a, a security protocol with not, um, uh, well, inherited secure pairing between request and response, um, you may run um, into troubles and you need, for example, uh, take particular care of the use of uh, intrinsically not cryptographic information like uh, the co-op token. So this is an attempt to uh, improve the formulation of those two uh, requirements from the framework uh, to stress that, uh, yeah, what we have at stake here uh, is really the binding between requests and responses that was uh, somehow not present, only one of those two requirements and that uh, you really have to take care of the combination of the communication and security protocol. Uh, while it was not clear exactly uh, what of the two uh, or uh, if both of them together uh, were responsible for that. And interestingly, uh, the uh, profiles already published as RFC are um, just fine and already complying with the new formulation. So this is more in the interest to be uh, uh, well, providing a clean formulation and be ready for future profiles to uh, not run into troubles. Uh, is there any feedback on, on this text, how to make it better or revert, <laughs> meaning keep <laughs> the current formulation instead? Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I I thought the the current formulation was pretty good, but uh, I'm, I mean this is uh, this is more wording. I think it's not it's not critical, in my opinion. So when you say combination, it always uh, you always think about multiple options here. So uh, that's why I prefer the previous formulation but it's 
no, no big opinion. No, no major change needed. Thanks. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, inspired by uh, what we did in the previous document I presenting, uh, aligning with the use of problem details instead, we thought of uh, making that also on the ACE framework as such uh, altogether. And ACE has always used a custom uh, uh, format for error responses, considering these three parameters, um, error, error description, and error URI. And that, of course, very much uh, predated the work done um, on problem details in 1990. Uh, so I got some feedback uh, on hallway discussions uh, at, at the Prague meeting that were positive about uh, making the switch altogether um, in the ACE framework. And in this version of the draft, we already have well the full proposal uh, compiled, basically, where uh, we are uh, deprecating uh, the use of the uh, old format and instead recommending the use of uh, problem details. And it's quite simple and, of course, uh, aligned to the format the final together in an RFC. Uh, it's just about defining uh, a particular element of the problem detail uh, item map. Uh, so to say, they would be the ace error uh, item that is supposed to include only uh, one element, error code. And the value of the error code would be taken just from the same ACE error code registry that we have uh, already. So the actual values to indicate the, the specific error are the same from the same unchanged namespace. Uh, they will basically cover the old error uh, parameter, while uh, error description and error URI are instead replaced by already defined uh, standard entries uh, for the problem detail data item. And I try to sketch, uh, in short, the mapping uh, also here um, in this slide. Uh, so this should be uh, the new recommended format to use. Uh, and if the actors involved uh, in an execution of the ACE uh, framework support this, uh, they must use it for their outgoing messages. And well, it's better if others uh, get aligned with that. But formally, the, uh, the old format is intended to be uh, deprecated. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, these are the next steps. Uh, the first one I mentioned already uh, in the previous presentation, this is going to come back in other slides I have during this ITF meeting. But uh, as I said, um, the previous document is the Gainia pig in a sense, uh, but then it's, it's good to do this transition for better uh, placeholders and examples uh, altogether. Uh, at a higher level, uh, I think we have a good roadmap for this document uh, in its Appendix B, uh, and it's about uh, the alternative workflow specifically uh, to be sure that it correctly works, uh, also in case we want to uh, request an access token for updating access rights or for re-uploading the same access token like some uh, profiles do, uh, and be sure that it can seamlessly uh, really work in, in any profile altogether, hopefully future-proof. Uh, and then we have also some more uh, parameters in the queue, uh, some uh, specifically in the interest of the new workflow, uh, some instead uh, workflow independent. Uh, so that's our plan. Uh, comments are welcome, of course. Joran. Yeah, um, yeah, I think this is a good summary. And uh, I just wanted to raise one of the uh, items that was appearing in the hackathon um, a limitation in the current version uh, where you, when you do token upload, is kind of binary. So, um, so the, the, the client is asking uh, the, uh, the authorization server to upload uh, the token uh, to the RS. And if the token is uploaded, uh, then it's not provided to the RS. And uh, there might be the case that um, the RS has lost the token and uh, then uh, down the line, so so the or it's deleted the token because of lack of lack of space. So in that case, the client has to return to the AS. Whereas um, an alternative would be that um, the client would actually be able to configure and um, have a copy of the token and to provide it to the RS when when needed. So that was uh, I think was a good. Good discussion, and I don't know what what you think about. Is that something uh, you like to bring up here, or um, something for 
future uh, releases? Well, we can definitely include it in version uh, two, I believe. <laughs> I didn't mention here also in the interest of time, but yeah, that's the plan. Okay, and with Dave in the queue as well? Yes, we have Dave in the queue. Hey, Dave Robin. Hey, Marco. Um, this is Dave Robin. Uh, I have one question. I don't want to go too long. Into Dave, time. can you speak a bit louder, please? Oh, sorry. Like, can that... you speak a bit louder and like, closer to the mic? This must not be on. It was on when we tested it. You may just Is not be on? close enough. <laughs> okay, I'll, I will eat the mic. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, the question is, uh, you're in this new rev, you said you specifically made the client need to be aware of this. You know, you changed it. And I'm wondering, was that a security thing or why? In other words, we, our, our use case scenario, we're actually saying the preloaded tokens are for clueless clients that don't even know they need a token. They have the full credentials to meet the CNF in the token. They're strongly credentialed. They can identify themselves, but they're attempting a protected operation. They don't even need, know that they need to go get a client a token. So the AS pre-delivers their token to the RS. The client attempts the operation, does the cryptographic stuff, says yes. You know, the RS knows who he is. He binds to the client bound token, everything works great. The client didn't even know that he had a, a token that was delivered for him. So this is an important use case for us because we have gajillion clients that are existing today and very few RSs that want to protect themselves with protected operations. And so the client may not know anything about tokens, but he can strongly identify himself. So the AS effectively pre-delivers the client's token to the RS on behalf of it because it's client bound. It's not a secret. It's not a bearer token. So this works great, we think, um, because the client doesn't even know that he's using tokens. So I'm, I'm just, I, I like this. Uh, the alternate workflow really piqued my interest. And so this is great. This is exactly what we need in a standard way. The AS knows about the RS's needs. He pre-delivers the token to the RS. The client comes along, attempts a protected operation that he would normally need a client a token for, and it just magically succeeds. And it's a, a great migration plan to get clients. And anyway, I was I was curious to know. You said no, we changed it, so the client must opt in. And I want to know why. Why must the client be aware that this is happening? Is it possible that the client is just simply thinking, I don't need a token here. Let me go try something. Oh, look, it worked. Yeah, thanks for the support uh, and, and the question. Um, it, it wasn't about security. Um, we thought that minimally the client has to say exactly what you said. Uh, the risk is otherwise that the client is totally unaware and it is expecting the response coming back, if successful, to include the token. And that's not what happens in case of successful uploading. In this from... scenario, the client is not talking to the AS at all. The client doesn't to, know to the AS token. No, it's, well, it's, it's, it starts with a request to the AS. Yeah, he, he attempts an operation and he gets an answer back then it works because that operation normally would have needed a token to be loaded ahead of time, but it's already loaded ahead of time, but it wasn't by the client. Right, we, we, which, which is good. But if the client is totally unaware of this possibility, uh, it is expecting a token back uh, in a successful no, response. An answer to a, a, a protected operation is just doing something to an RS and it gets back an answer of something that it wanted to do. It's, it's reading Dave. a property, writing a property. So I, I'm, I'm taking too much time. I was. No, no, Dave, <laughs> I just there's a question from Goren to you. Is the client even ignorant about the AS? And then also Absolutely. from Christian. Yes, and, as and a migration strategy, these clients are fully identified, strongly cryptographically, TLS certificates, everything. They can prove who they are, but they don't actually know anything about tokens. They predate tokens, they predate ACE. So the RS wants to protect himself from some clients, right? So he's gonna deny certain operations. The client just comes along and if the AS has delivered a token to the RS on behalf of this clueless client, the operation just succeeds. The client reads his property, he gets his answer, 
or he writes, turns on the light. You know, the client is a dumb light switch, right? It's a fully credentialed light switch, but it doesn't know about tokens. Again, this is a sort of a migration thing. This is an existing client. So we want to use the ACE tokens, but they're delivered by two people that know about them. The AS and the RS are sophisticated devices. The client is dumb. So we don't want to invent a new like local access control mechanism or something in the RS. We want to use tokens, but the token is simply delivered by, instead of being poked in there by the uh, client using ACE, it's poked in there by the AS ahead of time. The client comes along, doesn't know any difference, operation succeeds. So, okay, uh, yeah, I, just, I'm, I'm, I, I was. It's kind of like your alternate workflow seemed exciting to us because that's. But uh, maybe if that's not what you had in mind. Yeah. The uh, question is simply, why does the client have to opt in? Was it done for security reasons, and are we missing something? There, there's a bunch of more discussion in the chat that it seems like a lot of people agree with you that this might actually be a good idea. And so let's take it to the list okay, and, great. and continue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Dev. Thank you. Oh, that was the last slide for me, basically. I, I'm done. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, it looked like Thank you. More slides for me. Thank you. All right, so that was workflow and pram. So we're on to group OS core profile. Yes. All right, go ahead. Yep, thank you. So uh, yeah, hello everyone. So my name is Richard Höglund and I will be presenting an update to this group OS core ACE profile draft that we've been working on. So starting off with the motivation, um, it's about uh, application scenarios relying on uh, group communication where a client can access uh, resources shared by multiple resource servers uh, using this group of core protocol, which is a protocol for secure end-to-end -end communication uh, in groups uh, built on those core protocol. And the point of this draft is to enforce the access control within the group uh, for resources at these servers in the group. So a client wants to send a request to a set of servers in the group, then we want to enforce access control. Um, because you could consider a simple use case where you just say that, okay, it's enough that the, you know, the client is a member of the group and that should grant it specific rights. Um, and that can be maybe fine in very basic use cases, but for more advanced use cases, you really want uh, proper access control and you know being able to give different rights to different clients and a more fine-grained approach. And that's what this draft provides. Next slide, please. So we want to have the separation between the group membership and access control. Uh, and again, like just being a group member does not imply any access rights. Uh, and this also means that the concepts of how do you become authorized to join the group, um, that's one thing. And another thing is that, okay, once you've joined the group, how are you authorized to reach resources at the service in the group? And that second point is what this uh, draft covers. And we also uh, kind of employ this zero trust paradigm where we focus on uh, resource protection where um, yeah, you don't you want you want uh, uh, not to have this implicit granting of granting of trust, basically. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So, as an overview of the the actual content, um, to summarize, a group of score profile praise uh, it enables access control for the resources at group members, and you use group of score as the actual security protocol. Uh, between the clients and RSS, again, enabling secure uh, group communication. Uh, the group joining, that's a separate thing, and that has to happen first, and that's not covered by this draft, that's covered by other documents, like number three there, uh, the uh, ASCII group comma score. Uh, and in this draft, we make sure that the access token is bound to the existing group of score security context and to the authentication credential of the client. 
and a number of properties that we enable is proof of possession of the client's private key, uh, which is achieved when uh, when verifying the first group of requests from the client. And we also support both the pairwise mode and the group mode of the group of score protocol. Um, we also have proof of group membership for the client and we have mutual authentication. So next slide, please. And this is just an overview of the protocol flow. Uh, I don't need, I won't go into this in, in too much detail, but basically you see that um, basically the client is requesting an access token from the AS. Uh, it receives that access token, and then it can uh, proceed to post that to resource server one and to resource server uh, two. Um, and after that, it can actually communicate using group of score uh, to these resource servers that it has posted uh, tokens to. So it's an authorized to access them. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, to go into some of the updates we did uh, in version one, um, we clarify that if um, an access token is to be deleted, for instance, because it has expired, that does not mean that the actual group of score security context should be deleted because that came from a separate entity, typically from a group manager, and that should that should be actually pre-existing before you even got the token. So uh, deleting the token should not mean deleting that context um, because that context is needed for a possible other group of score com communication that can be ongoing in the, in the group. We did some renaming of the TLX TLS export the labor for computing uh, proof of possession input that the client uh, provides to the AS. And we have changed the name here to uh, exporter A's pop input client AS because that's more appropriate as um, it's focusing on the actual uh, proof of possession input computation. And it's irrespective if you actually use uh, signatures or Mac to compute the pop evidence uh, that the client provides with AS. And whether you use signatures or Mac is dependent on the on the particular um, configuration of your group or score context. And that comes back to the point of we support both the group mode and the pairwise mode of the group or score protocol. So next slide, please. Yeah, further updates. We differentiate now between um, how you compute this C to AS uh, proof of possession input um, when you use uh, DTLS uh, 1.2 or 1.3. And this is because the key exporters have uh, slightly different uh, interfaces. We also revise the computation of the pop input when the client and AS are using OS core as the communication protocol. So Basically, the, the proposition input is the output of an HKDF extract step. And previously, we had it, we were thinking that, okay, the HKDF algorithm to use, that's something you have pre configured on the AS. Um, but we thought about that a bit more and we realized, okay, why not just say that the HKDF algorithm is the same one that is used in the OSCORE security context shared between the client and AS? That, that's a simple solution. And we also clarified another thing, which is that in the calculation of the PRK, you have uh, a salt as input, which is a concatenation of two elements. And element two, X2, is the uh, Acebo byte string with value the OSCORE ID as sender ID of the client. That's unchanged. But we clarified that X1 is the OSCORE ID context as a zero byte string or the simple value null if no OSCOR ID context is used. And that was kind of a missing case in the previous code, in the previous text. So we didn't cover the case where you had a um, non-existing OSCOR ID context. And then, yeah, we did some various nits and editorial improvements. So next slide, please. Um, yeah, some other small changes, removing these quotation marks for the um, super simple values. Um, and we did another point that was a little bit more substantial. 
and that was about updating and defining specific requirements that the AES must fulfill for, for verifying this proof of possession evidence that the client provides to it. Um, and basically the, the point of this proof of possession is that the client should prove possession of the private key that it's using um, for uh, the actual group of score communication. Um, and we realized that, okay, we had it a bit underspecified. So we now say that the authorization server must support the authentication credential format that's used in the group. And if this pop evidence is a signature, well, the AES must support the signature algorithm and curve used in the group. If the pop evidence is a MAC, the AES must support the ECDH algorithm that is used um, as paradise key agreement algorithm in the OSCO group. Because, I mean, the AES just has to be able to verify the pop evidence fundamentally, so it must support these uh, same uh, uh, algorithms, curves, or uh, such that the client is actually using. Uh, but practically, we think that this is not an issue to have this support because it's expected that the um, a client and RS supporting this profile, that they will be registered <clears throat> at an AS that actually do support this algorithm. So it's a matter of uh, correct configuration. Yeah. Next slide, please. So summary and next steps. Uh, to summarize, this is an ACE profile uh, for secure group communication, enabling fine-grained access control within a group um, for communication with the group of core protocol. And overall, the, the core of the profile is stable. We did some refinements in the last version, but no actual fundamental changes to the functionality. We do have a couple of planned next steps, though. Uh, number one was also mentioned in the previous presentation is to avoid these text string placeholders and go with the approach uh, in this draft, uh, Borman, Seabor, EREF. We also want to support access tokens that can target um, resource servers that may be in different OSCAR groups, because now we only support tokens um, targeting resource servers in a single group. Uh, we want to also revise the text a bit regarding the profile requirements, um, also related to the workflow and params uh, presentation. And finally, we want to say that if you want to also use the OSCORE profile after you have al uh, already used the group OSCORE profile, how may you do that? So for instance, you may want to use a different audience to indicate that, okay, now I want to actually use the OSCORE profile. And the whole point is that well, the group of score profile only supports group of score, but you may want to also run the OSCORE profile to be able to communicate using OSCORE. So you can actually use these profiles um, at the same time, in a sense. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, that was it. So thank you all for listening. And if there's any feedback or questions, speak up now or, of course, uh, on the mailing list. All right, thank you. Thank you. And it looks up up next, we have ACE EST o OS Core. I don't know that we got slides. Oh, actually we did. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So good morning or good afternoon, everyone. This is Malisha speaking. So I will present the updates to the EST OSCORE draft, which talks about certificate enrollment using OSCORE. So the equivalent of RFC 9148, but using OSCORE. So the current status, uh, yeah, could you go back, please? Yep, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, the current status is that we published the 04 version on 4th of March, 2024 which resolved the remaining issues from John Matson's review. Uh, and then we did some miscellaneous updates to the draft based on the discussions in GitHub, uh, where we are tracking everything uh, related to the draft. So the goal of my presentation today is to present the resolutions of closed issues and discuss the status. Next slide, please. 
So the first closed issues, uh, the first closed issue is on uh, is issue number thirty four. Payload formats should explicitly mention seaboard encoded object. So this was uh, seemingly an editorial issue, which made us go through the, uh, which made us track the updates to the ITF COSI seaboard encoded certs draft. Uh, as we are referencing the uh, IANA numbers that are registered in that draft for all the CBOR encoded objects that this draft supports. As a reminder, uh, our EST OSCORE draft, the draft I'm talking about, uh, supports both ASN1 encoded, uh, ASN1 objects as well as CBOR encoded objects. So now we have two sections. Uh, that's uh, and two tables, corresponding tables in the draft, which uh, summarize the uh, content format identifiers for the corresponding CBOR and ASN1 objects. So this is main, mainly, as I said, this is mainly editorial, but it made us track all the uh, all the IANA numbers and TBDs from the COZ draft. Next slide, please. So the issue number 35 that we close is on normative requirements and content format support, SN1 or CBOR. So the context here is that uh, our draft may support the transport of both SN1 or CBOR objects. And uh, content type negotiation obviously happens through co-ops, uh, co-ops accept options. So we did not invent this. This comes from, uh, from ESD. And uh, we needed to specify the normative requirements on what should be supported by the servers. So we discussed this during ITF 118 in Prague and later on in GitHub. And we settled on the following formulation where we have a must on the server to support both the ASN1 objects as well as the CBAR encoded objects. Uh, and then to leave it up to the client to support either only ASN1, CBOR encoding, or both. Next slide, please. Uh, the following issue, uh, on this issue, there is, uh, there is a discussion item that I would like some feedback, I would have to ask some feedback from the working group, so, so please bear with me. So 38 is on content format support for their encoded uh, uh, SN1 objects. So uh, ESCO brought up an issue in uh, RFC 9148 uh, that the old, the current text, in a both RFC 9148 and in our drafts has a may on support of content format 287, which is the transport of a single certificate. Uh, while uh, the uh, which may lead to interoperability issues where client supports only 287, but server supports uh, only uh, 228, which is multiple uh, a different format carrying multiple certificates. So ESCO commented that in Anima, they discovered that there are some management uh, problems if the client uses only 287 and that it's a very limited method of getting only one CA certificate. So he pointed us to a draft in the Anima working group, the Anima constraint voucher draft, which has a text that I quote below uh, on how they handle this. But essentially, uh, and they handle it by requiring the client to uh, be prepared to support both a single certificate, so 287, but as well 281 content format. So this has a consequence that the client should have the implementation of the 220, uh, 228 content format, which collides with the current text in our draft. Uh, it is up to the client to support only content format 228, 20, 227 or both. So this is a little caveat and a little open issue that I will open uh, and, and a little issue that I will open as a follow up of this meeting. Uh, and, but I guess in the interest, if there are no comments to this, I guess in the interest of time, I can move on. Yes, please. Uh, we might be running a little bit uh, over yes. time. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So number forty-three is on uh, stating sufficient conditions for a signed certificate signing request to be used to enroll in uh, an elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman public key. 
So this was opened by Yoran on 9th of February 2024. And the issue here is that we describe uh, we describe how to use static Diffie-Hellman keys for enrolling, uh, how to enroll static Diffie-Hellman keys. Uh, but it turns out that uh, these keys can also, uh, they are in different, in other specifications, uh, namely those uh, referenced by NIST. Uh, these static Diffie-Hellman uh, keys uh, are exceptionally used for signing operations. When uh, signing the first time CSR uh, used for the enrollment. So right now we uh, added new text in the draft that specifies that we allow the use of static Diffie-Hellman keys for signing this uh, uh, for one-time signing of the CSR uh, for enrollment. And here this is the excerpt below from GitHub on the exact text that ended up in the draft. As always, the uh, uh, this is tracked in GitHub. So. Uh, next slide, please. So this brings me to the open issues. Uh, there are three open issues. Two of them are editorial 29 and 19. Uh, so it's mostly about the message flow examples and cl clarifying the scope in the introduction and clarifying the abstract. And then there is one open issue that uh, considers the use of challenge password attribute for signature keys when ad hoc is not used. So we are, uh, we are, uh, next slide please. So we are uh, almost there. We have three open issues in the GitHub tracker. So we believe this is kind of getting ready. Uh, we would request some more reviews from the working group before declaring it, uh, before declaring it ready for the working group last call. So uh, I, I'll let the chairs comment if they could help me out on that one. But that would be all on my update uh, for today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And uh, yeah, if you could take a look at this one, that would be great. Uh, we would like to get it out there as well soon. All right. Uh, let's see. Yep. And so we had the request to reverse the last two. So I think we're on ad hoc OS core profile, right? All right. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 We can hear. Okay. So I'll, I'll try to be quick then since we have another presentation coming up. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, so this is the, the outline. You can go to the next slide. So I don't think I need to say much about the recap. There is. Um, this is a profile of the ACE framework and the authentication protocol which you use between client and resource server, in this case, is ad hoc and OSCore. And that's the two round trips uh, on the right-hand side there. And this is an example in uh, one of the optimized workflows. So what's to note here is uh, the access token, the location of the access token in this flow. We already talked about the alternative workflow and, and here it's indicated in message three. Uh, so you can go to the next slide, please. So that was one of the main changes uh, in this version. We removed the option. We had three options before. We uh, so what remains now is you either transport the option in message three, as was indicated in the previous figure, or you use the generic method described in the ACE framework, which is using post authorization info. And the reason why we did this was that there is no you cannot essentially make any use of the token or not much use at least until you receive message three when you have authenticated the request or the, the client requesting. So that's that's the point when the resource server anyway can do any uh, anything uh, useful. And at this time, the, the message is, is confidentiality and integrity protected. So, so the access token will be, uh, there will be no privacy issue regarding uh, contents of the access token. So that was the motivation. That's done now. Um, we also updated a few other things. Um, so in uh, we you, you can now either transport the access token or an identifier, the session identifier, in case you uh, you know that the access token is already 
available at the RS. You don't need to carry it uh, all the time. So, and, uh, so I think I go to the next slide. Just to move on to the discussion point. So there are, uh, there are three slides here um, about one type of optimization which we are doing and which might need to be complemented. So long, long story short, uh, oh, my video is gone now. Can you hear me still? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. OK, good. Um, so um, yes, we can hear. Yeah, that's, that's the important part. So um, what happens is that we are using key identifiers for very compact representation of, for, for very compact identifiers. And those can be replaced, those can replace the use of a credential. And here, here is an explanation how that's used uh, for, for the client. And in slide two, it's for the, uh, for the resource server. But the problem is that these key identifiers are selected by, in this case, it's the client selecting the key identifier, which means that if you have multiple clients, you might have um, collisions. And that's not a problem. This is basically intentional. Um, this is for small settings where you, where, you, where you might not have a large set of clients, and then you can settle for a very, uh, very uh, small identifier space. But what happens if we have a slightly larger set where you have where all the clients are selecting a very uh, a one byte or um, uh, key identifier or even zero zero or something like that? Very simple, and that's the that's actually the case. So you can flip uh, two slides ahead. So stop quickly at the slide next slide. Uh, yeah, okay, that's fine. So this, this, this is the same question for the, was for the client and for the resource server. And what we say here is that use of, of key identifiers is very it's nice, very short, not unique though. And for many to one settings, what we would like to have, in particular, if we're looking at this case, which is the raw public key case, uh, where uh, we would like to have uh, a way of uniquely identifying those. And the natural way to do this, uh, we think, uh, is to use hashes. So, and it so happens that uh, we are not aware of this being defined anywhere else. So hash of CCS would be then a natural identifier. Uh, CCS is the C CWT claim set, which is a C CBOR web token without a signature essentially. And that's the way you identify public keys in ad hoc. So that would be the natural uh, object, but we don't want to carry the whole object. We like to only carry the hash. So that's our... Uh, proposal here that maybe this should be the document where we register the COSI, uh, the CBOR header parameters, and also the confirmation claims, which we can use then in, in CBOR web tokens, uh, for hash of CCS. And at the same time, then you start thinking about X5T, which is sort of a hash of an X, X509 certificate, then you'd like to do the same for, for, for CWT and also for URIs. Any comments on that? I hear none. So yeah, so that's that's at least the proposal. Uh, Mark, Marco in the queue. Oh, Marco. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, regarding the CWT part, there was a presentation today uh, in COSI uh, with a document that is trying to do basically that uh, for CWT. Uh, there's a subtle difference. Um, Edoc considers specifically a KCWT. Uh, which is a CWT including a cozy key. I'm not sure if we, if we can build uh, in, in that same strong way uh, from that cozy document. Um, if so, or, or we can build that sort of implication, uh, CWTs may be covered by the document already. Fine, excellent. So this was the purpose of raising this here. If someone has but done something, a... we can. Yeah. We can reuse. Yeah, that there's, there's that caveat to check, though. Um... Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> Thanks, Marco. Great. Um, if I have time, there is a final slide here, uh, which is another issue, which we don't have time to talk about. I just want to mention um, that there is a discussion on how to use the reverse flow. So ad hoc is allowing the reverse flow as well. That you um, basically instead of mapping. Um, message one to request, you have a trigger as a request, and then you map message one to response. 
And in that case, we would use a different message for carrying the token. And uh, how do we handle that? So that was basically the question. And I think it's it's fine to use EAD2 for that. So the message two, there are some different properties in terms of who can read this. Um, so an active attacker would be able to read uh, in message two, which is not the case for message three. But on the other hand, using post authorization info, then it's actually uh, available even to passive attack attackers. So we have a, a, an issue on this, but let's continue the discussion on 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 the issue or on the mailing list. Yep, that sounds good, and we're out of time, so we won't get to the uh, last presentation. But thank you for everyone for an excellent meeting, and uh, have a great day. Thank you all. Bye bye.